Hi, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to the online launch of Channel Issue 9. I am SR, and I have been the channel publishing intern for the year of 2023. Um, this launch marks the final launch of my time here at the magazine, so it's a bit of a bittersweet moment, but I'm so glad that I get to share it with you, and I'm so grateful for the past months that I've been able to work in Issues 8 and 9 alongside our editors, Cassia and Lizzie, and of course our Irish language editor, Ashling. It's been an honor to work with them and to have learned so much from them and to have been able to bring so many wonderful works to the fore, some of which you will be hearing read today. Um, before further ado, I'd just like to extend some thank yous, firstly to yourselves for tuning in and for supporting the channel. Thank you very, very much for being here. As well, I'd like to thank our wonderful contributors for Issue 9 and our cover artist, Isabel Nolan, for the fantastic, fantastic work that is gracing the cover of our magazine this time around. I'd also like to thank our funders, the Arts Council, as well as Forest Nagrelga for enabling us to publish Irish language work this year, which has been a fantastic, fantastic development at Channel. Um, I'd also like to thank our patrons, Hannah Gaden Gil Martin and Sarah Nishikawa, as well as our anonymous patrons and also our subscribers. Thank you so much for funding our work and keeping us going. So during this launch today, um, what you'll be seeing are some pre recorded readings from our contributors, along with some photos showcasing the parts of the world that they're lining from. The lineup with timestamps is going to be in the description box, and closed captions are available as well. So, without further ado, Let's begin. New Mexico with tail lizards are parthenogenic. In grassland bordered desert, the heat of sand against her slender body, a female replicates her chromosomes alone, orchestrating whole genomes. Through virgin birth, she bears daughters identical to herself, clones unconcerned with inheriting her pale blue tinge her brown and yellow stripes, her spottiness, knowing in their nascence they are their mother. The mating behavior of burying beetles. He meets her near a hedge of hydrangeas, where a blackbird has landed after falling from a telephone pole. Its body cools as it waits for them to make a place for it below loosened soil. Together they preen it, feather by feather, as its mother had when it was still in nest and embalm it with honey-colored spit. They mate and make its corpse a sacrament for their nursery, so when their tenorals emerge in June, it feels the air under their hind wings. Okay. Hi, I'm Abby Yacht. And I'm Yoni Hammerkasoy. And um, we're going to read today a um, collaboration that we worked on called Deconstructing Babbles. It's a lyric epistolary exploration and basically letters that we've written back and forth to each other. Um, and here goes. Dear Abby, did you hear the jackals cry last night? The air was looking glass still, and I couldn't say if they were down the street or kilometers away. Piercing howls, cryptic. One moment you'd swear they were mourning a lost mother, and another, it's a party, like teens in a swing park passing a bottle of Arak. The moon was a sliver past full, so maybe those jackals were surprised by the amber light when it slid over a building. Maybe I dreamed it all. Part of me is desperate to blur the lines between built and wild, wants to stretch them like gum and step through. And then what? Does it make any difference knowing nature goes on despite all our efforts to break it? Sometimes I think this city is what's left after an ocean has drained away. That it's not jackals out there, but whale song set free from the bedrock that wind wishing through yellow brush as a tidal wave's ghost. This stillness, this stifle, I know it's how seasons change, swinging from extremes until a new agreement settles in. And I know change just is, as it always will be, but that doesn't soften the unease it leaves behind in the night's fleeting shadows. So tell me, please, how will we survive summer after the jasmine vine withers. Dear Yoni, 
I sometimes hear my neighbors cry through the gap between buildings by the bathroom window. It gives me shivers, like a sudden change in nighttime air, this portal into distant lives, an excavation of drained oceans, imprints of mollusks on sandstone. I live in satellite to many lives here in Talpiot, but I cannot hear the jackals over trucks and speeding cars on Chavron Road. I anchor myself in the face in the looking glass, not to get swept away by speeding particles of humanity, this congestion, this pulsing ocean we tend to be. Did you know? They want to take all these buildings and make them reach higher. In summertime, the top floor is already dense with rising heat. In Talpiot, the jasmine intermingles with street garbage. The cats love it, but later the scent will ripen. It is never entirely dark here in the industrial zone. The clouds are tinged orange by street lamps and window lights from tall buildings. When I glimpse the moon between buildings, it is a gift. And in a primordial shift, I wish I could howl. Dear Abby, after the moon sets, there's a purple envelope of time when birds come alive and bless the unfolding day. Their songs invade my sleep until my sleep becomes song, and I can almost count them by name. First a blackbird, then a mina. But then I get lost in sparrow chatter as if it's a passing rush hour crowd. Get lost in the crows trying to boss each other around. I know they like tall lookouts, so maybe they paid to push up the skyline. This pulsing ocean of humanity always wants to go higher, so why not froze? I say, let's build more towers of Babel if it'll save some green space outside the city to play in. And then what? Yes, back to that, I'm afraid. It's a hazard of age, bright ideas with no clear end. What's the point of saving something just to ruin it later? This place breaks my heart one headline by one, but I haven't figured out somewhere better to love. In happier news, below the fold, tucked into a smudged corner, I read that archaeologists found a 12,000-year-old whistle made from bird bone, buried in the muck of a long-gone Hula Valley settlement. Even so, they can't decide if it was used for music or hunting or some other charm. They say its sound matches cries of sparrowhawks and kestrels that even today roam the sky searching for prey, and I wonder what it must be like to blow and feel the vibrations of the unanswered call. Dear Yoni, noises, so many damn noises, I feel like I'm drowning in them. It's the dryer that bangs on to the beat of a silent song, but the song could also be the voices that assault my ear and the traffic, and the water boiling, and my car starting, and every moment of every day condensed into noise. I'm glad you've been hearing birdsong, a shade of silence in a way. Do you mean there is peace that can be found here in this city? Imagine all the noise of all the places and all the centuries squeezed into a single space, the linchpin that is Jerusalem, the babel that is constructed and deconstructed at any given moment here. We come together and we collapse like a burst eardrum. Last Shabbat, I lay in the grass, and even there, I couldn't escape the rumble. Today, I considered going to the beach to see the tides, but this noise I've isolated and consumed tied me here to the city. I couldn't escape. And even in my dreams, where there is nothing, no noise, the banality of it all creeps in. I open the pantry door. I turn on the kettle to boil. I press the brakes in my car. There is no bird song in my dreams. I could devolve to ancestral times, spend my days singing with the birds, feel my own vibrations, and leave language behind. Did you know? We lo once lived in trees, too. Thank you for listening. Thanks, everyone. Hello. I'm Susanna Lang. I want to start by thanking Channel for including my poem in issue nine. Here is the poem, Crow and Anti-Crow. The crows started it. One crow would make up a brief poem, something like, no one owns the sky. The rule was the next crow had to contradict the first. Crows own the air they speak into. A person who wasn't a crow, but knew the language, added, 
The axe owns the branch where the crow sits, then translated the poem into English and waited for an answer, human or corvid, while the crows found another tree. So I'm going to add a related but more recent poem I spend part of every year in southern France, a town called Uzis. And in October, the jackdaws gather. I think it must be part of their migration. And there are huge numbers of them. They're a very democratic species. Every morning, there is a big conversation that rises in volume until they all agree and lift up into the air in huge murmurations. And then in the evening, they return and have a huge conversation about where to roost before finally settling down where they always settle down um, and staying for the night. The collective noun for jackdaws is a clattering, and that is the title of my poem, A Clattering of Jackdaws. The waiter is clearing tables while the last of us finish our meals. It has been a long day. Overhead, the jackdaws are deciding whether to settle into the plane trees, a process that requires vociferous discussion. This might not be the best roost for the night. They have to consider the options, as they did last night and will again tomorrow. A long day, so many diners hesitating over their menus. The waiter bangs two saucers together, making a noise like a jackdaw with a frog in its throat. The birds hush a moment to hear his objection, then resume their own forum. They will roost here tonight after all. Only firecrackers will chase them away, says the waiter. I enjoy their loud democracy, but he has waited all these hours for the moment when the square is empty and quiet after we leave. We whom he has served all day, whose tables still need to be cleared. Thank you again. Hi, my name is Podge Meehan. I would like to thank everybody involved in channel for including me again in your wonderful journal. I'm going to read the introduction to my story, An Inconvenient Truth. I think it's important to point out that the narrator is female. Dad died weeks before the wedding, which he would have smirkingly described with his sideways nod as inconvenient. He went for his usual walk around the block just before sunset, fiddling with his new Bluetooth headphones and listening to these podcasts about murders in rural Ireland that for some reason he couldn't get enough of. The path he tread unchanging, it would make it down the gentle slope to the back of the next estate, the newer one, where the semi-detached, slightly more middle-class folk looked back up at us in disdain, where he had found a wall to sit facing west to watch the sun disappear into the low, distant hills. The mother would stay at home and get some scones that she had made in batches out of the freezer, and she'd get the tea on, and wait for him to come back. Only that time, he didn't come back. They said it was a stroke, a sudden calamity of the brain, and he slumped forwards off the wall, and it took us ages to find him. Maybe if he'd been at home, the mother could have called an ambulance, and because the house, where they had spent their whole married lives together, and where I and my brother had grown up, was close to the hospital, maybe, just maybe, something could have been done to save him even if that meant he was a vegetable of sorts, which again is something he would have smirkingly described as inconvenient. Don't mind me, he would say. I don't want to be in the way now. We buried him, a huge inconvenient funeral, a parading of dull, aging acquaintances from a life lived medium well, and that was that. Only, of course, it wasn't. Everything was changed, forever tainted with the reverberations of the moment his brain thirsted for the calm flow of blood and the oxygen carted within. Life went on. The days just kept coming whether you were ready for them or not. Decisions had to be made that no one wanted to make, and we, the three left behind, bickered and bit and talked shit about each other on WhatsApp. The wedding was delayed, first by a year, and then because the biological clock was ticking by two years. At least that's how we presented it, but realistically we got pissed on Pink Sangria in Madrid visiting some college friend of his with a new husband. And if it hadn't been for the fact that I was always going to marry him anyway, I would have had the abortion I'd always feared. 
So by the time the wedding came round, it felt like a normal Saturday with too much shit to do. A mighty inconvenience. Thanks for listening. Camera Obscura. When I can't fall asleep, I stay up and watch late night reruns, invariably conjuring your face to the screen. I try to find the right words, yet they never come to mind. I want you to sit here beside me, although you've gone into the next room, saying that you need to see clouds moving across the sky. Rivers of melted snow rushing down mountainsides in spring, or an owl roosting in a forked branch, while above it the moon begins to rise. These, however, remain elusive. Perpetually receding, they flicker fitfully before going out, extinguished like phantoms trapped in a piece of obsolete machinery, and I am unable to tell. If I'm inside of a small round building with an angled mirror at its apex, or holding a darkened box with a convex lens for projecting an external image into the world inside, I wonder if I'm the object or its outline, and if there is even a difference. And remember the first time we met, compared to how you look when you walk out the door, driving away in your car, its trunk and back seat filled with your suitcases, the best half of our book collection. The trees on either side of the road turn a deep shadowy green with twilight while a sharp-shinned hawk circles overhead, ignoring your departure. Ring of fire. The sky looks really hazy today. The fires are still far away, but you can smell the smoke if you open a window. Not that I'm going to do that. It's over 120 degrees out there. The weather guy says that you could fry an egg on the sidewalk. I could go outside and give it a try. That could be my goal for the day, frying an egg on the sidewalk. Except that I'm taking the day off today. No goals. Just a day of lying on the sofa, triple screening and getting stoned. The good thing about living with Eugene is there's always some grass around. Eugene isn't really a dealer. He doesn't hang around in alleys or at school gates or anything. He only sorts out his friends. Not that I'm with Eugene for the grass. I used to be crazy about him. We haven't actually had sex in months, but that's not the point. The air quality has been terrible all month. They say that we should stay indoors, wear a mask if we go outside. All my gigs have been canceled. I, I don't mind. I don't like being in a room full of strangers anymore. Not since the bombing. I'll drive a half a mile out of my way to avoid passing the McDonald's where it happened. We're not broke, but we're not rolling in it either. I'm still getting royalty checks on a song that got picked up by a coffee commercial last year. It's the one I wrote about loving Eugene. Until the end of time. We blew most of the licensing payment on a trip to Mexico and a new car. The royalty checks pay the rent, but not much more. Eugene works part-time at the coffee shop. They've had to close the terrace because of the smoke, which has cut their capacity in over a half, so he's probably going to lose his job. Things are going to get tight if the fires keep burning. Not exactly the best time to break up. A Soul Hits playlist is streaming on the stereo, giving me a soft, homey feeling. The television is on mute, relaying the images in red and t red ticker tape running along the bottom. My computer is all set up to play some solitaire as I scroll through the feeds on my phone. If I'm in the zone, I can do all three at the same time. Four if you count the music. I can feel my brain split into tidy info packets, streaming parallel feeds. Al Green singing, the clicking rhythm of the card game, the flow of memes and photographs as I scroll through my phone, quick eye flicks at the mute television. A road cordoned off by foreign looking police cars, a weather map with fires in bright red and orange, a close up of a shoe floating down a floated st flooded street. A screaming red breaking news fills the TV screen. I turn up the volume. A man was swallowed by a large sinkhole as he waited for a bus, says the newscaster. I find this ridiculously funny. I laugh so hard that I start to cry. I can feel my face tightening, fighting to keep smiling. 
The corners of my mouth want to pull down, to open wide in a desperate howl. The sobs are lining up in my chest. Not now, not now. I don't want to feel anything. Not now. I take the half smoke joint from the ashtray and spark up, filling my chest and smothering the sobs. The phone pings. A friend has sent me a clip of a black bear hanging out in an outdoor hot tub. He looks like a Hollywood mogul lounging in the water. I giggle, imagining that the bear has a gold medallion, a big cigar and a cocktail with a little umbrella. Priceless. I hit like and then change it to love. Eugene is gone for the day. He said where he was going, but I didn't bother to register. I miss him when he's gone, but I miss him most when he's around. Living with Eugene used to be wildly romantic. We were like two cartoon characters with red love hearts floating around us. We couldn't keep our hands off each other. Get a room, our friends would say, and we'd laugh. We could spend all night talking, limbs wrapped around each other, hands entwined. Now we talk about who forgot to buy light bulbs or whether to cook dinner or order in, our hands caressing our phones instead of each other. Ping, a picture of a cat in a tux. He looks dashing and seductive. I hesitate between like and laugh. I settle for the surprised emoji. Sometimes loving Eugene feels like waiting at a bus stop, wondering if the last bus has gone. The TV is flashing breaking news again. Images of flames and blackened trees fill the screen. The reporter says that the fire is burning a football field size of forest every minute in the Amazon. I'm not interested. I mute the TV and go back to my triple screens. We've got our own fires to worry about. Moving right along. Ready for some cuteness overload? Hashtag you bet. Hashtag kittens. No trespassing. I love the stupid crows and wasps that bother me on walks. This is why I squawk at the empty truck next to the no trespassing sign. A man is somewhere out here with me and I don't care about his hobby, job, skill, or free time. This forest isn't mine, but neither is it his. I love dorsal recumbencies in snakes and turkeys and animals I cannot see right next to me, previously lying down, startled at my primal howl. I had meant to let them be, but since there is another person through the leaves, it may as well be me that breaks their peace. A softy who would rather interrupt their nap or play than hear them shot, pesticide sprayed. I love the flies, the deer chock full of ticks, the over eager squirrels guarding hemlocks that nut hatches would love to call their home. If I was alone, I'd shut my mouth and never write this poem. But since I'm not, I tilt my head backwards and scream. Just like the Fisher cats that displace my dreams, the breakfast crumbs escaping off my sleeves, generating trails, disrupting the ecology of marsh and streams, leaving a trace just like I learned I shouldn't. Hi everyone, thanks so much for tuning in and I hope you've enjoyed our contributors' readings and photos as much as we have. I'd like to say another big thank you to everyone who shared content with us to feature in tonight's launch and also to all this issue's contributors for making it one we can be so very proud of. If you'd like to buy a copy of issue 9, you can do that through our online store, for which we've left a link in the description box or you can get it from one of our stylists around Ireland, who you'll find listed on our website. You can also find out on the website how to become a subscriber or a patron, 
and receive each new issue on its release if that's something you have the means to do at the moment. We have plans to expand our practice in some new directions in 2024 and especially at this point of transition we're truly grateful for all the support both financial and moral that you give to our work. I want to let you know that this issue's publication is a a sad occasion as well as a happy one for us on the channel team in that we're saying goodbye to half of the four-person team who've been making the journal together this year. Our wonderful publishing intern, S.R. Westwick, who you heard from earlier, is finishing up their time with us. And our co-editor, Elizabeth Mota, who found a channel with me all the way back in 2019, is moving on from her role to focus on other areas of her creative practice, projects that I expect will continue to inspire our work for years to come. So thank you to Lizzie and to SR for all you've given to channel. Watching the journal grow and change through your input has been nothing short of magical, and your contributions absolutely won't be forgotten. A couple of announcements about the future, as well as our advice before we finish up for tonight. We're going to be reopening submissions across all forms for issue 10 from the 20th of November to, through to the new year. And we'll really look forward to reading your work. We're also going to be reopening applications for our annual publishing internship from the 1st of December to the end of the month. So if you're based in Ireland, on the island of Ireland, and you're interested in working with us, please do consider applying. You can never replace SO or indeed last year's intern, Dorje. But whoever you are, we're really looking forward to meeting you. So that's it for tonight. Wishing you all a, a safe and happy winter, and we'll see you again in the spring.